pleasure to be here this evening. Very daunting in front of this audience, but also daunting because of the quality of the preceding talks, which have been really tremendous. So um, I, may, I may be a bit of a contrast. I mean, you have come here to hear a statistics lecture, haven't you? I mean, that, that is my job. That's what I do. Um, but I have got this book, Sex by Numbers, which is quite, I think it's quite good, Statistics of Sexual Behavior. That's the cover. The cover's not bad. That was going to be the cover. And... For some reason, I thought it was very good. And they said, I can't of that. No, no, it's too funny. Nobody will read it on the tube. So that's not the cover. So I'm going to talk about sex. Now, one of the problems of being a statistician is that you want to measure things, you want to get numbers. What is sex? What is, no, don't answer, don't answer. This is not a quiz, but what is sex? And, and the person who was really concerned with defining sex was Bill Clinton. Back in uh, 1997, there he is great friends with Monica Lewinsky, and those who you remember is that they were more than just friends. There was oral sex going on between them. And then, but with them, when he was uh, interrogated about this, he said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. And this became a matter of deep constitutional importance because he was impeached for lying. The future of the presidency of the United States rested on whether oral sex counted as sex or not. So beautifully, the Kinsey Institute then released some data they'd measured from students years before on what they considered as sex. So here we've got deep kissing, not very many, touching each other's genitals, a few consider that sex. Oral sex, less than half consider it sex. Uh, penile vaginal intercourse, that's pretty consistent, except there's obviously a few men there who <laughs> are are waiting for some extraordinary event before they feel they've gone all the way. I think they're possibly doomed to disappointment. Now, what was interesting, though, is that when the impeachment trial came up in the US Senate in 1999, 45 senators said he was guilty. In other words, oral sex is sex. And 55 said he was not guilty. Oral sex is not sex. Almost exactly the same proportions as the students said. However, I'm going to ignore all of that. Officially now, sex is vaginal sex, oral sex, or anal sex. So that's how sex is going to be defined as a sexual partner from now on in this talk, because that's how it's defined in the recent surveys, the good recent studies. Oh, by the way, the, uh, the editor of the journal that published this paper got sacked. So... Um, uh, <laughs> Clinton got away with it, the editor didn't. Okay, so this is what we typically think of as sex statistics, this sort of drivel. The, the reader's survey, whoa, they're absolutely filthy statistics. They're also completely rubbish because they just consist of the people, as they say, the sample consists of the, those who chose to fill out our sex survey online. So it's big, 10,000 people filled it in, it's still rubbish. It does not represent anything except the few people who want to fill out a timeout survey. So I've given this a star rating. One of the things I, I do in the book is to say, you know, sex statistics, if you Google that, you'll find a lot, most of them rubbish. So you've got to distinguish between them, and I give them star ratings. And of course, one of the lowest star rating statistics of all, which I deal with in the book, is on sexual violence, and that relates to the previous talk. Um, you know, they're terrible sex statistics on the whole. Um, and actually, I, I must say, a small intermission, it was tremendously inspiring, that last talk. As a small step, I do recommend going onto the PSHE Association website and seeing their new material they're releasing for teachers on talking about consent to children, to um, people in school. So it's some, there's some really good material coming out on this issue now. Okay, so the survey I am going to report data from is, is a bit better. I call it three-star data. Still not perfect. It's the NatSal survey. Big survey done every 10 years, 15,000 people. Um, the one in 1990, Margaret Thatcher tried to ban. She re re took the, fa the funding away, but it still got funded. And they produced, oh, ah, ah, no, before that, ah, quiz, quiz. Now, quiz, you, do you know you've got to know your, your gender, you've got to know how old you are, and you've also got to know how many times you had sex in the last four weeks. Don't say. This is not, uh, this is not a survey. I do not want to know. And only opposite sex sex I'm talking about at the moment. And I'm only talking about those who are sexually active and others who have had sex once in the last, at least once in the last year. How many times have you had it in the last four weeks? Don't say. However, this is what was said in 15,000 people who got asked. So you can find. There's women, there's men, there's your age group. Find out where you are. Plot yourself on the graph and you can find out whether you're above average in the top 25% or in the bottom 25%. And you can see the crucial thing there is the decline with age, the apparent, and with a, but with an average, a median, of three times in the last four weeks. 
So people in Britain report having sex three times in the last four weeks, at least in the, in the 16 to 44 age range. It's even lower, of course, with older, older people. Okay, so you can decide whether you're above average or not. I don't want to hear. Um, the crucial thing is, though, is that this number has been going down since they've been doing this survey. It's gone from five to four to three over the last 20 years. And that's the standard picture that associates it, the iPad. It's the curse of the iPad. I think the box set is also terribly responsible for this as well. <laughs> but this is what's given as a responsibility. Uh, but I'm a statistician. I don't care why things happen. I just want to know what's happening. Okay, next question, which I do not want to answer to. How many sexual partners have you had in your lifetime? Sexual partners, anal, opposite sex sexual partners at the moment. Um, uh, anal, uh, vaginal, or oral sex. So counts the partner. Can you count them up? Can you count them up? Have you got any idea? Are you going one, two? Are you going, are you taking off your shoes and socks? Are you going, well, sort of thing? Well, this is the sort of th graph you get out when you ask. I've got, I've got 35 to 44 year olds, of which there are some in the audience here. So this is the, the reported number. I'm not saying the true number the reported number of sexual partners. And the most common number is one. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> However, there is what we statisticians call a long tail to this distribution. I have actually truncated this at 50, because if I wanted to put the whole graph on, it'd be down around somewhere down by the River Thames. So, you know, this has to be cut off. But notice what's happening here. Notice how there is psychology of response. Up here, people are counting. They're remembering. They're probably remembering names and faces. By the time it gets here, they're getting a little bit vague. And so, well, sort of, how old am I? What's been going on? By the time it gets to here, they're using very round numbers. 30, 35, 40. And so, well, pfft, yeah, we give or take. And they're getting a bit vague, except this guy who said 47. Now, what's he doing? <laughs> Extraordinary capacity for memory. Obsessive person. Anyway, as I said, it goes out, it goes out to at least 500 on, on this one. But the other pattern is, of course, is that men, the blue ones, are saying they've had more sexual partners than women. That is mathematically impossible. They cannot have had more partners with women. And this is, this is a, a, a tremendously you know, uh, re regular finding. People, men do respond, re re um, say they've had more sexual partners with women. And there are all sorts of excuse, reasons why this might have happened. Are we missing prostitutes from the survey? Um, are men just lying? Are they exaggerating? Are they, but a lot of it, so there's a thought, there is some exaggeration, some under, under reporting of women, um, but also that just the method of rounding, you know, are you just sort of making a rough estimate also, a strong suggestion that many women will not necessarily want to consider some of their uh, experiences as sexual partners. <laughs> They'd rather just forget. It's so, okay. So, uh, what about same-sex behavior? This is one of the most fascinating findings. I mean, I mean over the last 20 years, we've heard, I've heard that you know, uh, opposite sex, the frequency of sex has been going down. The staggering change, the real change. So this is 1990, 2000, 2010. Women and men, this is a same-sex partner in the last five years. This is same-sex experience with general contact. This is just, you know, a, you know, a sort of Madonna-type snog or something like that. Massive increase in women, particularly young women. Huge increase in same-sex behavior in young women. What's interesting, of course, is that um, if you actually ask people about their identity, you know, what do you consider, which is now part of national statistics, is part of the official national surveys. What is your identity? Do you consider yourself gay, lesbian, or bisexual? It comes in only at about two and a half and three percent down here, both for men and women. So the, the, this is a really strong finding that most people with same-sex experience will consider themselves and label themselves as heterosexual. So there's an enormous amount of experimentation going on here, but not just and, and also, it shows this, you know, what it, the, the idea that what percentage is gay is just a meaningless question, unless you really define, what are you talking about? Are you talking about attraction? Are you talking about behavior? Are you talking about self-professed identity? This is a very subtle issue, which needs to be very carefully deconstructed. But the crucial thing is massive change in behavior. Okay, now, these are all what I call three-star statistics. They're not bad. They're fairly accurate. They, there's some undercount in 1990 in particular. They feel, for example, mas I'm, I'm, I could give a whole lecture on masturbation if you want. There's a very good chapter on it, by your own hand, I call it. Um, but, um, <laughs> it, 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 I, for example, but it wasn't even in the 1990 survey. They didn't dare ask, whereas now everyone just says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
all the time. They, what I'm interested, I, I like good, I want some, not just three, I want four star statistics. I want real official statistics. And so there's a chance for this because from 1837, we have been collecting civil you know, data. You have to report what's happening about births. And you can from that infer, try to infer something about behavior. For example, this is the bastardy map for 1842. <laughs> So this is a bastardy in Britain in 1842, and um, who's top of the league table? Norfolk. So <laughs> anyone here from Norfolk? Yeah, no change there. So that's um, so we all know about Norfolk. So this is what happens. So this is some good data, and. Here's, you know, this is the sort of thing you can start measuring. You can look at, you know, how, how many babies are being born, total fertility rate. This is an extraordinary, this is an extraordinary pattern, in fact, that um, the, uh, there was a decline from sort of natural fertility in the 1870s. Throughout the late Victorian period, people stopped having babies. It got basically down to two, just, you know, just sort of, this is our fertility transition that every country has to have. France did it before, other countries have just done it recently, some have not yet done it. We did ours in the late Victorian period. Massive mystery, how did they do it? Because they weren't using much artificial contraception. So this is a huge historical mystery. How did the Victorians stop having babies? There's another mystery, and this is my favorite mystery, and, but these are connected. This is the sex ratio. This is the number of boys born for every 100 girls. It's 105 at the moment, so um, 21 boys are born for every 20 girls. There's always more boys born than girls. That's happened. It's not constant throughout history. This is good data. This is what I call four-star data. You can believe these data. What are the peaks? When are more, most boys born? What's the pattern? End of wars. End of wars. End of wars. Same in America, same in other countries. More boys are born at the end of wars. Now, whoo, is this, um, you know, is God sort of replacing the, the lost with more boys? It's not so stupid. Maybe it's not God, maybe it's Darwin. There's a strong, there's a, there's a strong suggestion that there's, within some mammals anyway, there's an evolutionary ability to control, to a small extent, the gender of your offspring to that which is most favored by the circumstances. So there is, there's a, there is that suggestion. I don't believe that. I think there's another solution. I know there's a, um, William James at UCL has been pushing this for years, which I rather like. And the idea is that the idea is that this is due to what happens else happens at the end of wars. Do you know what else happens? Soldiers come home. What do they do when they come home? They have sex. They have a lot of sex. These are periods of intense sexual activity, as was 1973. I could tell you a whole story about 1970s, which, I'm, which we've heard a bit from Viv already, <laughs> that um, we don't want to go into now. But um, these were times of intense sexuality, sexual activity among the young. And this is an interesting sort of story. The suggestion is that if you have a lot of sex going on when you're on home on leave or just come back from uh, you know, being uh, demobbed or something like that, if you have a lot of sex, there's, there's, it, it affects the time of the cycle at which women conceive. If there's a lot of sex, you will tend to conceive earlier on in the cycle, in fact, before the most fertile time around ovulation. So that intense sexual activity leads to a change in the time of conception. And there's a strong suggestion that very slightly, the, when you conceive in the cycle, it influences the gender of the baby. Very slightly, just, a few, just 1% maybe. But that would be enough to explain this, this, um, this signal. It's been shown, it's been enough to explain the signal, because it's still only 1% extra boys. It's not a way to, having a lot of sex is not a way to um, you know, make sure you have a boy. Um, but in this case, it might, and the idea is that, okay, if, that, if lots of sex means more boys, what does very few boys mean? No sex. And look, it's very consistent. Very consistent. So this could be interpreted under this hypothesis that a steep decline in the amount of sex going on in the late half of the, of the Victorian period, which is exactly would explain this. So there's a theory that through the sex ratio, you get an idea that as an idea that Victorians essentially were not having sex. They were, you know, so they were enough to have lots of babies, but they, um, they were practicing abstinence, continence as it was known. So uh, you can learn a lot from, the, from these statistics in this way. Okay, oh, I'm, I'm think just about finished. So what about another number? That's a, those are four star numbers. Uh, they, you know, there's, one, there's lots of crappy numbers. Kinsey's only about two star on the whole. Sheer height, dreadful, great stories, terrible stats, but one star. What about this, a seven year itch? Is this a good number? Is this a good, do we believe this one? Well, actually, it's a four star number. 
It's a four-star number. If you look, these are the official statistics from the Office of National Statistics at the, the risk of getting divorced, starting from marriage, if for marriages that have lasted five years, so what proportion then have a divorce at that time? You know, you start off very optimistic, or very keen. <laughs> the peak risk time is at seven years. That's the peak time for risk of divorce. After that, you think, oh, God, might as well stick it out. And, um, <laughs> and, and off, you go, off you go down to here. So they believe the seven-year itch, I, I thought, oh, what nonsense. It's true. It's a really precise number. Okay, just to, oh, the last dribbles and last couple of things, which has nothing to do with my, but one of the things is about sex is that, you know, this is quite a light talk about sex, I must admit. And one of the things that I'm afraid I've got a real schoolboy sense of humor. And so uh, one of the things I do like is where is visualizations is, is unintended. The publisher made me take out the double entendres. It was full up with stupid schoolboy jokes. And most of them, there's a few left. I, I, um, I, I, I slipped a few in, as they say. But um, <laughs> so um, the, these are the kind of things I like, which are, which are unintended humor. This is a, a Japanese pharmacy, which um, obviously thought its uh, logo was, uh, was just fine, but could be suspicious. But this is actually my favorite for this, this company developed this logo, and which was thought was fine until someone looked at it sideways and realized it looked like that. And, uh, and at that point, you realize you really, everything, this is all in the eye of the beholder. So uh, thank you very much indeed. So.